So welcome to this webinar on uh, refresher training for candidates. I'm going to go through a few bits and bobs. Um, first of all, there is a chat window, which is going to be down here somewhere, more or less. Um, so feel free to make use of that. I'd recommend that you send messages to everyone, um, just because then it gives you everyone a chance to kind of weigh in on what's going on. So um, I'm going to minimize the chat window for now, because otherwise I get terribly distracted trying to read and talk at the same time. So I'll give that a miss. But um, if you have any questions as we go along, then do submit them in the chat window. And um, that's, yeah, I'll come to them at the end. So I'll just close that down. Right, so little test for you. I've given you all, and hopefully everyone has got this, the ability to annotate. Um, so let's just check. Yeah, yeah, that should all should be there for everybody. So if you want to choose a colour um, and use your arrow to start with, then um, as a test, I'd like everyone to see whether they can work out whether they are male, female, or other. So I am in the female element of this. Rob, very good, is in the male element. If anyone else is uh, interacting with Sarah, there we go. If anyone else wants to uh, to indicate their their uh, personal gender, then uh, there we are. Now, so this is one way that we'll be interacting during this presentation is to uh, indicate your preference or your choice or which option applies to you. Another way is the bit on the right of the page. So if you put your arrow in uh, the left-hand column, then use switching from the arrow to the little text tool. Um, you can then type in what you had for breakfast. Very important um, in this instance. So if anybody wants to do that, it's basically a way of claiming a line on the table. So you don't have to take the next line down. You can take the one underneath that or the one underneath that. I don't know if Rob or Tara um, or uh, who else was in a minute ago, was it Chris, um, wants to do that. Who's, someone's put porridge on top of my shreddy, so that's absolutely fine. Um, but essentially, if you want to, to claim any line of this table as your own, um, then you can do that. And you can, of course, also change the color of your text, which is very exciting. Um, I don't know if anyone else is as fond of shreddies as I am. I find it hard to believe, but there we go. So these are the two ways that we'll be interacting today. One, by using your arrow to indicate your preference um, in a table, someone had toast, excellent, um, or using your arrow to claim a line uh, in a, another table and then using the text tool to write down some text in that table just to share with everyone else. So that's, that's something we'll be coming back to as we go through. Now, to begin, what are we going to cover today? Well, we're going to be looking at where the pathway came from. We're going to be looking at the life cycle and deadlines, very, those terribly important, very annoying things. Um, we'll be looking at the stage definitions and how they've changed for the new syllabus. Um, we'll also be looking at reflecting on your development and also testing your knowledge to make sure that the stage scores that you have allocated yourself um, to your can um, or that your mentor has given to you um, are truly representing your level of knowledge. Now, this refresher is aimed at Men, uh, sorry, candidates. Um, there is one for mentors on Thursday. So if you are a mentor, you're perfectly welcome to stay, but you may want to uh, swap to the one on Thursday instead. And um, this is also aimed at candidates who are on the new syllabus, the one with the learning outcomes um, one to six in the core and uh, underpinning elements sections. Um, if you are still on the old syllabus and therefore going for the exam in November, this um, some of these things will not apply to you. So just bear that in mind. So let's begin with the idea behind the pathway. Why is the pathway as it is? Well, this is the PD cycle, professional development cycle. And this is something that was created in the 70s. It may well be something that uh, Socrates or someone came up with sometime before that. But essentially, it goes plan, do, reflect, record, and then add some feedback. And in fact, the feedback element isn't traditionally part of the professional development cycle, but it's something that more and more professional bodies have decided it's really essential to have in there. So bearing in mind this professional development cycle, now look at the pathway cycle. Um, you've got uh, plan, uh, develop, record, um, and then you've got the actual submission of what you're doing. Then you've got feedback. Okay, so going back, looking at that other one, plan, do, reflect, record, feedback. And then coming to this one, plan, do, reflect, 
record uh, feedback, you know, you've got exactly the cycle here. So this is why the pathway is set up as it is. So um, that just quickly kind of puts the pathway in context and explains why we ask you to do all the things that we do. So the deadlines on the pathway are what runs it and also unfortunately what annoys the most number of people. But deadlines are of course very important. Uh, timekeeping isn't something that's explicit on the timetable. But if you can't keep to deadlines as clients and uh, contractors and so on will ask you to do, um, then you're not going to be a terribly good landscape architect. You're going to be unpopular and have trouble um, getting recurring work and recommendations. Um, and it's the same sort of thing on the pathway. If you don't keep to the deadlines, you're not going to be able to progress. You're going to miss opportunities to take the exam. You're going to have to spend longer filling out development logs um, than you need to. So um, it's very important to keep to these. And they're fairly straightforward. Um, they've been the same um, as this for the last two years. And what we've got here are the candidate deadlines, the mentor deadlines, and the supervisor deadlines. Of course, the most important for you guys are the first two. Candidate deadline is always on the last day of the quarter. And it's always on midnight at the last day of the quarter. So as it ticks from 11.59 PM on the 31st of March to 0000 on the 1st of April, that is the deadline. Um, same thing, 30th of June, 30th of September, and of course the 31st of December. Now this last one does cause some problems because of course many people are doing things other than filling out their development logs and clicking submit on the year's eve. But it is regardless, you know, sometimes we do have these unpleasant deadlines that come in at inconvenient times. And I think overall it makes it quite easier to remember when the deadlines are that they're at the end of each quarter. Now, the mentors have an additional week after the candidate deadline. So a week after the 31st of March, you've got the 7th of April. Same thing, 7th of July, 7th of October, 7th of January. Again, the January deadline isn't terribly popular because some people like to take a little bit of leave after Christmas to extend their Christmas holidays. And 7th of April has in the past overlapped with um, Easter. But again, you know, these are real life deadlines, so that's just how these things fall sometimes. And again, having them consistently a week after the end of the quarter, I hope makes them easier for people to remember. Lastly, the supervisor deadline is um, it's a bit of a mouthful, but it's, it's basically a month after your own deadline. So you've got the first of the month of the first of the second month of the next quarter. So there we go. That's that's how we summarize it. Um, but basically, the supervisors have roughly four to five weeks after you have submitted um, and about three to four weeks after the mentor has submitted to read through not just your submission, of course, but the submissions of all their candidates and supervisors have, you know, around 20 candidates each. Um, so they'll read the submissions of their candidates and then the mentor reviews as well. And then they'll write their feedback for their individual candidate and mentor. So these are all the dates. Um, now, there are occasionally grounds for um, extensions. So the only reason for an extension, um, or the only two reasons, well, three really, the two official reasons are if there's been a serious illness. Now, we're not talking about food poisoning or a heavy cold. We're talking about you know serious illness, um, hospitalization, broken bone, that kind of thing, something that means that you can't be sitting at the computer. Um, we're also, the other reason is a bereavement, and unfortunately these happen to all of us from time to time, they're inescapable. Um, it doesn't have to be an immediate relative, um, it can just be someone who was meaningful to you and has therefore upset you and, and means that you're not inclined to sit down. We don't require documentary evidence of either of these things. Um, it's assumed that you are being honest and truthful as, as you are um, bound to be under the code of conduct, and therefore we, we take it on trust that one of these things has happened. The third possible reason for an extension is um, an act of God, as the insurers would call it. We did have a number of people who were trapped by an Iceland volcano a couple of weeks ago. There were an amazing number of candidates and mentors who just happened to be on holiday in areas where the volcano went off um, that weren't able to get back to the UK and were otherwise unable to find a computer. Um, but again, we take all these things on trust. So if this happens to you, you are uh, trapped by a volcano or affected by an earthquake or something like that, then we will, of course, um, give you an extension in one of those cases. 
lots of work, forgetting, and in particular, getting married are not reasons for extensions. Um, the getting married one always surprises me, as does the honeymoon one, because unless the word Vegas crops up somewhere, it's unlikely that these things will have happened to you without any warning at all. Um, in the UK, you, you tend to need about 15 working days' notice between putting in your bands and uh, actually getting married. So you at least have a little while to plan um, that you, you're going to need to submit early, even if you did have other things on your mind. So, um, yes, those aren't accepted as uh, excuses for extensions. Um, deadlines are very important to mark the deadline in your diary. Um, and also think, do either of you need to submit early? So, you know, always think about that. And think about that whenever you meet your mentor review. Have either of you got holidays coming up? Are either of you, again, something that seems to happen quite a lot unexpectedly, which of course does happen unexpectedly sometimes, is having a baby. Are either of you pregnant or is your partner expecting a baby? You know, are family members unwell? Um, is it a busy time of year if you've got loads of deadlines coming up in your office? So, you know, to work out whether either of you need to submit early and equally, you know, at the same time, review your workload as the deadline approaches. As the candidate, you are in charge of the process, okay? It's your career development. It's your career progression that's at stake here. So don't leave it to your mentor to arrange meetings. And also, don't assume that they're going to leave time for these things. Excuse me a moment. Unfortunately, I do have a cough. So I will disappear from time to time, just so that I don't hurt your eardrums with my aggressive coughing. I'm also surreptitiously trying to eat a cough sweet while giving this presentation to try and stop coughing. So um, excuse me if you uh, hear any odd slurpy noises. Um, anyway, as I said, it's your responsibility to drive the process. And the best way to do this is to hold regular update meetings with your mentor. Um, these don't need to be you know, officially scheduled meetings with agendas. If it's fine, you know, if you're in the same office, then five minutes um, over a cup of tea, maybe, might be enough as a, a quick update. Equally, a five-minute phone call um, with a more remote mentor or a Skype or something. Um, just to touch base, see how things are going, make note of any big things or four small things that have come up recently, ask a question or two, say goodbye, you know, that's plenty. So these don't need to be really in-depth meetings, but it's good to be in contact regularly. The same way as you might be um, with a parent or a, a son or daughter or something, um, or even a distant relative, just to touch base and see how things are going. And it all ensures that there aren't any surprises, um, either to you with your mentor suddenly saying, ah, oh, right, yes, I'm off now for four weeks, um, or to your mentor, you know, not realizing that, that you were going to have a huge submission this quarter because you've been doing so much stuff, so they needed to leave extra time for a mentor review. I've already said to review your workload as the deadline approaches. And then do finally make sure that you submit your development pack by the deadline. Now, I say that, I've got a little screenshot here. This is a candidate uh, log. I'm sure you've all seen these. This is where the candidate, whose name in this case happens to be Adam Good, has logged in and clicked on development packs. And um, Adam wants to check whether he has submitted his quarter three development pack yet. Yeah? And so he looks here, and we can see that there's nothing against the candidate submitted date. So this space is empty. Um, that means that Adam hasn't submitted. Okay, so whenever that space is empty, as it is now, um, that means that the candidate hasn't submitted. And in fact, in this case, you can tell that quite easily because it actually says here, ready for submission. So it's actually ready for him to submit. Now, if you think you've made a submission and you want to check, let's just move on and I'll show you what it should look like. Um, so this is another candidate who um, was submitting last quarter. So he's got his quarter deadline there and which dates it covers. So has he submitted? We have a look and there it is, candidate submitted date. And what do we have here? We've got the date and time that he actually submitted. Now you can see that this candidate actually submitted at 21 minutes past 11 at night on the day of the deadline. So he was cutting it pretty fine. Um, but he did submit, and when he submitted, he will also have received an email. 
um, confirming that his submission had been received. So if you ever want to check that you've submitted, first of all, you should receive an email. And second of all, there will also always be a candidate submitted date. And this is in the development packs screen. Okay, if you don't have a candidate submitted date, you haven't submitted. All right, so that's something to check when you come to make your submissions. Now, a little bit interactive again. Those of you that weren't here earlier, you should have a toolbar that's got an arrow pointer, which will give you an arrow just like mine there. Um, and you've also got a little T for text, um, which gives you the ability to add text in colors other than yellow um, that are actually visible. But in this case, we're just going to use our arrow pointers. So when is it that you tend to submit? Um, so if you have the ability to do this, now um, I tend to submit at any time because I tend to submit uh, for test candidates when I'm testing the system. So I'm going to say that I tend to submit a week before the deadline. Rob hasn't yet submitted, nor has Matt. That's fine. Anyone else want to admit um, how close to the deadline they submit? Um, Chris, very honest of you, Chris. I'm, I would say that about 80 to 90 percent of people should be there shoulder to shoulder with Chris. Robert, you're still on the deadline, but slightly, slightly more organized, hoping to get some dinner in um, once you've submitted. Um, yeah, the, if we were all being terribly truthful and interacting, then there would be lots and lots of arrows next to Chris, because most people do leave it until normally after 11 o'clock, between 11 and midnight on the day of the deadline, which always worries me slightly because I'm always thinking, but what if, you know, BT or Sky, you know, lost your internet connection? What if someone cut through a cable? And, you know, then that's it. There's no, no grounds for an extension. Cutting through an internet cable isn't an act of God. Um, Equally, uh, you know, what if you've got a cold or what if a family member, you know, called up and needed you to come over or something like that? So it always worries me, these last minute extensions, um, sorry, last minute submissions. Anyway, so there we go. That's when we submit. But as I say, most people do submit in this section. If you don't, then you are planning ahead and this is wonderful. Um, or perhaps you're planning to submit last minute even for Chris. Um, but do try and think and in advance and leave plenty of time to submit. Um, just so that you don't leave yourself susceptible to any kind of last minute delays or uh, concerns. Now, we talked about keeping an eye on your workload in the run up to the deadlines. Well, one way to manage your workload, of course, is to work out when the deadlines actually are. And don't forget, you can submit early. It's really not a problem to do this. You can submit um, months early if you need to, if you are, if you or your partner are expecting a child or you're moving house or getting married and you know that the last month or even the last two months of the quarter are just going to be a complete nightmare, then submit after a month, submit after six weeks of the quarter. You know, it's not a problem at all if you just want to submit an abbreviated development pack. Um, equally, if you just want to submit a week or a few days early, that also is fine. And the same thing goes for your mentor. Of course, the mentor is expected to submit after the candidate, um, but if they do unusually need to uh, submit before, then you know these things happen from time to time as long as that's not happening regularly. Regular meetings with your candidate, um, sorry, with your mentor, um, mean fewer surprises. Um, just equally, regular meetings with your team, with your manager, um, or with clients mean fewer surprises as well because you're, you've got a better idea of what needs to be done when. Um, and really, it's all about communication. Just making sure, just a quick email. You know, by the way, don't forget, I've got this huge project happening up at this master plan, this planning inquiry um, happening at the end of the month, so it'd be great if we could meet the week before, something like that, you know, just very quickly stops there being any panics at the last minute. And I said that time management wasn't something which is explicit in the pathway, but in fact, working with other professionals is explicit on the pathway. It's just it, it tends to be um, worded as other professions rather than other professionals. Um, it's equally important that you can work with other landscape architects, such as your mentor, um, and that you can negotiate with them if you need um, some of their time. Um, these are all important things, important skills to develop, and they're all things that um, the pathway steering group originally and now the education and membership committee that look after the pathway would like to see you developing during your time on the pathway itself even though they're not things that are explicitly tested during the exam. 
So how many times a quarter do you meet with your mentor? Time for that little arrow again. Um, I do not have a mentor at the moment, so I should probably put myself over here off at the side. Rob just meets with his mentor once a quarter. Well, that's all right if that works for you, Chris, so for the late submissions. He's there two to four times a quarter. And um, personally, if you're, I feel that the, the earlier you are in the pathway um, development, or the later you are, the closer you are to the exams, um, the more you need to see your mentor for their support. So if you're just starting out, um, you might need to run things by them, discuss things with them, probably quite briefly, you know, just talking about the little five-minute phone calls or emails. Nigel popping up there, excellent. Um, but um, that's that's something you probably need to do when you're just starting out on pathway. And then again, as you get closer to the exam at the other end of the spectrum, um, you're probably going to need to talk to your mentor a bit more, but a bit more in depth, you know, maybe having mini mock exams or full mock exams for a whole 45 minutes or so. Um, so I would say for those of you um, just starting out on the pathway, try and um, go, well, at least for two to four times a quarter, and maybe sometimes you might need a bit more. Once you're, you know, fully in your stride, then once or twice might be absolutely fine for you. And then again, as you get to the exam, you want to increase the number of times um, a quarter that you're meeting or contacting your mentor, just so that you can get their support. So we're going to move on now, and, and this presentation is by its nature a little bit of jumping about because it's just a refresher of um, candidates on the pathway. We're going to move on now to the stage definitions, and these have changed with the development of the new pathway. So stage zero is still pretty much the same as it was before. It means that you don't know what you don't know at this point. Very Donald Rumsfeld, is it? I must check, but I see his name because I keep saying his name. But um, anyway, so it's little or no understanding, so pretty straightforward. Stage one, um, at this point, you've got some basic knowledge. So you might not know um, exactly what is inside the shape, um, but you know uh, kind of where its boundaries are. Um, it's just, you know, you're not really sure what the contents includes. What am I talking about? Well, you know, you might know um, the, what an outline of a planning application is, but not exactly how to carry out all the different stages um, that it involves. Okay, so that's that's a kind of stage one knowledge. You understand the basic concepts, but haven't yet gone into any particular depth. Stage two, well, you've got the general knowledge and understanding, um, and you may have some experience of applying it, applying your knowledge, but again, you may need to ask for advice from time to time as well. So this differs to the old syllabus um, and the old definitions of the stages, because at stage two, it was more than likely that you would know how, the, how these things would apply if you haven't actually done it already. Um, in this case, you may have some um, experience of applying, but it's not really expected, and you're still asking for advice. So from a, a kind of drawing lines between them perspective, stage two on the new pathway is a little bit lower, um, a tiny bit lower than it was on the old pathway. But stage three um, is um, something that everybody needs to have in the areas where they are personally working. So in the past, you, you just needed to have a majority of stage twos. You might have a few threes in areas where you were working. You might have a few ones. On the new syllabus, um, you need to have a majority of stage twos, but you are expected to also have stage threes in the areas that you're working in, which means that even if you are all stage twos, you can actually still fail the exam if you can't show stage three area of knowledge, level of knowledge on the areas um, where your mentor has indicated you have them, um, which would presumably be the areas um, where you were regularly working. So it is quite a change there um, to what we've done before. So stage three, you've got a thorough knowledge and have often applied your knowledge in practice. Okay, so you're not the expert that stage three used to imply on the old pathway, but you are often applying your knowledge in practice. Um, you take responsibility for decisions, and you need little supervision, if any, um, or advice to uh, to carry out this work. 
So, you know, quite a change there from the old syllabus. And as I was saying, you know, we've gone from just a majority of stage twos to pass the exam to a majority of stage twos and some stage threes in the areas where you're working. So it's particularly important now that mentors do really understand what these stage definitions mean and that they're really testing to make sure that you can communicate a stage two and particularly a stage three level of knowledge um, during the exam. Okay, finally, we've got the new stage four, which I'm sure you've all seen in the uh, syllabus and in the guidebook. Um, other people may be coming to you for decisions. Um, you're capable of handling these areas entirely alone. You are basically the expert at these particular areas. It is extremely unlikely that anyone attending this webinar will ever get a stage four on any area of the syllabus. These stage fours are for people who are the Colin Moore of contracts, who are the Karasonic of LBIAs. Um, these people really are the experts. They're the ones um, who know the subject inside out. They're answering questions about it on top of landscape because other people are asking them questions about you know, particular details. It really is, and I cannot emphasize this strongly enough, but very rare that anyone on the pathway is going to get a stage four. The examiners, the supervisors, they might have one or two stage fours each. All right, it's very unlikely that you would get to be a stage four um, before you would become chartered. I mean, just, just purely because it would require years and years of experience and um, working things out in different situations, different permutations, learning things inside out. Okay, so very, very rare. It's really in there just because we, we sometimes see people who have got 30, even 40 years experience in landscape architecture, who just haven't been bothered about becoming chartered before. Um, and they're coming forward to become chartered. So that's why we thought we'd add to the stage four. And also to indicate that there was something beyond um, the stage three. So those are the stages. Let's move on now to reflecting on your development. Now, reflection really is important. It's um, the way of maximizing what you get from an experience. Because you can, you know, go to a, a I was going to say NSYNC, God, I'm so old today. Right, go to a One Direction concert um, and just buy a t-shirt. Or you can go to a One Direction concert and find out from the screaming teenager next to you that um, one of them is just recently broken up with his girlfriend and is therefore single, um, or indeed boyfriend. And so, um, you know, it's, it's a way of uh, reflecting on what you've learned. You go home and you think, hmm, they're single, and you start writing a letter, probably now, I guess, a tweet, I'm very old. Um, and, um, you know, you choose some suitable gift to, to send them uh, on Facebook or something like that. So, you know, it's, it's a way of reflecting and gaining from an experience rather than purely being there at the time. Now, moving away from One Direction and indeed at NSYNC in the 90s um, and moving towards landscape architecture, um, thinking about, you know, perhaps attending a planning inquiry, which I'm told, not being a landscape architect, I'm not sure, but I'm told they're generally public access and anyone can go in the back and listen. Um, say you go along and, and listen to one of these and see what's going on. Um, and then you go back to the office or, or to home and look through the legislation that applies and maybe pick up a copy of um, a project that you worked on in the office or that was worked on before you joined um, where a planning inquiry took place. Um, look at how the different stages applied to that project and reflect on what you saw there during the inquiry and see how it applies to a project that you're working on at the moment. You know, what if this happens? How would that affect you know, this outcome? So it's really um, a way of gaining much, much more, as I've said, than the actual experience of just seeing one direction in the flesh. Now, reflection you know, can reflect on both positive and negative. If you, say, gave a presentation, like I say, you gave a webinar and you had a cough, and you'd forgotten to bring your cough suites or you'd just taken the last one or something. You know, that's a, a negative aspect which you could reflect on, but you can make positive things out of that. You can make sure that you have a packet of spare cough suites in your desk and um, you can practice more in the, in the future and things like that. Um, so you don't just need to focus on what went really well. It can actually be almost more rewarding to focus on what didn't go so well so that you can do better next time. Now, 
you know, we're working on a more applicable um, uh, example, you know, say you have a client meeting um, and the client's asking you questions and you haven't got the answers or some, you're having to ask the guy next to you to answer the question because you, you didn't brief yourself on or didn't look up that particular bit or it's about a bit of legislation that you haven't read about yet. You know, yes, it might have been a bit embarrassing in the meeting that you weren't able to answer those questions, but not the end of the world and you're going to know better next time and be better prepared. Okay, so it's, um, it's, they're both really positive um, things to do, even if you do end up positively reflecting on the negative. So let's just have a little look at reflection in action, I should say, rather than on action. Um, well, actually, before we do that, let's just have this little interactive exercise. So use your arrow now to claim your line. I'm going to uh, get the top one. There we go. So anyone else wants to use their arrow, Robert, there you go. Yes, you have to put your arrow kind of in about an inch and a half or so, because otherwise your name disappears off. Although if you want to be anonymous, I suppose that's quite a good thing. Now, if you switch to your text tool now instead of the arrow tool, um, one word on what you did and one word on what you learnt from it. Now, I um, did a webinar, and what did I learn from it? Um, well, I haven't haven't put one word. I've put three. So I've I've learned that I should always have a spare packet of cough sweets in my desk um, as a result of doing a webinar. Um, so anybody else want to uh, share? You don't have to stick to one word if that's a bit an ordeal. Um, something that you've done recently, and just you know thinking about it, maybe you um, went into a client meeting. Um, maybe you helped prepare. Uh, yeah, deadlines, not last minute, that's it. Maybe you help prepare a, a fees um, for something or a tender. Um, maybe you helped um, promote your organization in some way. Uh, you suggested some changes to the website. Um, perhaps you went to a seminar and you learned something from that. Um, so it's basically, the idea is that you can sit down at the end of, well, at the end of a day or at the end of a week or a month even, and not just write in your development log, I went to a seminar and it was about cabbages. You know, you can actually say, you know, I went to a seminar, it was about cabbages, and this is what I've learned as a result of that. Okay, so it's all about reflecting um, a little bit more and gaining something extra um, from that activity that you actually did. Rachel is winning the race now, it's clear. Going, oh no, no, she's falling back against Robert. Anyway, um, so moving on, let's have a look at why we should reflect. Um, well, the key point is, as I've been saying, is it adds value. It also provokes thought, so it makes you think about things um, in a slightly more intense, in-depth way than you would usually. One of the things you'll find if you um, reflect on, for example, seminars that you go to, we've got a CPD day happening um, at the Eden Project on the 8th of November, a little plug there for you, which booking open this morning. It's going to be quite fabulous and include cream teas and the Jellicoe lecture afterwards as well as the Eden Project itself. Um, but one of the things you might find is if you attend the first seminar, and just reflect on it for 30 seconds while you're moving to the next room for the next seminar, um, you might realize that there were a couple of questions you could have thought, you know, could have asked at the end that would have really actually deepened your knowledge of a particular area you're interested in. By the time you get to the next seminar, you're thinking, oh, you know, I must keep my ears out and ears uh, peeled. Ears peeled? Well, you know what I mean. Um, and if there's any questions I want to ask, I need to make sure I get in there with them. And that means that you get more um, and a, um, from the next seminar you go to, and it's you know provoking thoughts as you go along. Um, it helps you reevaluate your objectives. So um, everybody in their quarterly statement is talking about objectives that they have for the coming quarter. Um, so reflection really helps you make sure that those objectives are suitable for you. Because it's quite common that opportunities arise as you go through a quarter and your objectives may well change, it's, you know, perfectly understandable. It can open up new perspectives, so you're thinking about things differently and quite often you can end up going off on a tangent, which might actually be really interesting and really useful to a project you're working on or a, a plan you're drafting. Um, it can help develop awareness of you know, the effect of what you're doing. Um, you can value your progress that much more. Um, so you know, when you move from a one to a two, you're really aware of how you did that 
and therefore you can apply it um, to other areas of the syllabus as well. It's a great way of enjoying success. All too often, especially with things like the pathway, anything that involves an exam at the end, you're just so relieved that it's over. You don't really have that much of a chance to give yourself a, a slap on the back and really enjoy the fact that it's successful. You know, you have a really stressful client meeting. How many times does someone saying, hey, that went well, mean more than you internally saying, thank God that's over? You know, but that's, you know, it should mean more because it's great that it went well. You know, it's great that the client was happy or, you know, it's great that the planning application went through. You know, so just enjoy the little successes. Um, by reflecting on them. It can also help you avoid recurring mistakes and it's also just generally personally very empowering and I know it's a little bit kind of awkward British people being talking about being empowered and so on. It's not really stiff up a bit but um, it's, it's great when you realize that you're in control and that you are the one that's making sure that you're getting a lot from things um, and that you are, you know, maximizing uh, the opportunities that you have, really, and making the most of uh, the time that you've got. And also, ultimately, if you're doing all this reflecting and it's adding value and developing awareness and so on and empowering you and avoiding mistakes, then you're going to actually need to spend less time learning about things kind of additionally. If you're getting much more from the time you're already putting in, it cuts down the amount of extra time you're going to need to put in. So it's definitely worth reflecting. Now the process of reflecting, you start, obviously, so you actually do something. That's, that's where the process of reflecting starts. You remember what it was you did. Um, personally, I'm quite a visual person, as anyone who's seen my desk will attest. Um, and so I find it quite handy just to jot down what I did and start a bit of a spider diagram. Um, identify the key issues or the key areas. Um, what was it you really learned? Um, from this? What did you get from it? Um, why is that useful? You know, how is that going to help me? Is there a project um, that this fits into at the moment? Or what kind of thing might it fit into in the future? You know, how, how could I uh, find out more about this? Is there more to be found out? You know, or is this the pinnacle of knowledge? Um, how could I use the knowledge that I've gained in the future? Um, and what changes could I make to the way I am now to make sure that I can include this in the future and that it will be useful to me? Okay, so there's the, the process of reflection, um, which is a kind of, well, it's about as, as technical a diagram as we get in CPD uh, spheres, but there we go. It's a bit like the professional development cycle, this process of reflection. If we now move on and think about how this applies to the pathway, well, you'll recognize this as a development log screen. Um, you've got your title, your start and your end date, your activity type, and the details. Now, this section gets quite used and abused, um, there's a great disparity between candidates as to what they put in this section. And this is where the process of reflection can really make a big difference. So let's just have a look at a sample development log. Um, because the one thing I want to emphasize is that development logs are not your revision notes. Um, the development logs are what you're submitting for your mentor, your supervisor, and ultimately your examiner to read. You don't need to write down um, exactly what it says in this particular piece of legislation because you're kind of assuming that your mental supervisor and person examining you on it are going to know what it includes all right and that's just extra information you're asking them to spend time reading all this stuff when you know they don't need to it's just something that you could keep separately so here's a sample development log, which I, I think is rather lovely. Um, this is a guy who, um, this is a real one from a guy who became um, chartered uh, a couple of years ago. And I have to say it is entirely coincidental. I don't just realize that the MBS are the ones that are, are sponsoring the CPD day at the Eden Project, which I might have mentioned is happening on 8th of November. Um, but anyway, so you've got his development log here. And so he's working on some sort of business park back in 2001, um, work-based learning. And then what he's done is he's put a description of his work, what he learned, and then where he's going to go from here. Okay, so just those three little headings. And he was one of the first people to start doing this. And it's something that I've quoted and shown people many times since then because I think this works really well. Description of work, what did I learn, and where to go from here.
So how does this fit into the process of reflection? Well, description of work is basically what I did. That's recalling. What did I learn? Well, that's identifying, analyzing, and contextualizing. OK, so you've got those three ticked off straight away. And each of these sections, if you go back and have a look, these are only one, two sentences each. You know, this isn't a long development log. And yet, it's really succinct. It's got everything in it that the mentor, the supervisor, and the examiner need to know. OK, so this is actually cutting down from um, the quantity that a lot of candidates will submit on the pathway. So we've got what I did and what I learned. And lastly, plan research is what do I do next? You know, what do I do as a result of this? And that's, you know, after that, once you've identified what to do next, that's when you can implement the change, um, which you then apply the next time you do an activity. And, you know, then you get into the cycle of writing down what it is you did next time. So really simple way to do things. So what I did, you know, what went well, what would have helped, what new knowledge have I put into play? You know, there's a number of different ways to do this. So you can split your development log up simply into different sections that you use, or you can, you know, go for something slightly more detailed like this. So it's going to depend entirely on you. But let's just go back and have another look at this. In something, you know, quite simple like this, he's not writing revision notes. He's not putting in information that the mentor, you know, and examiner and supervisor don't need to know. He's contextualized it. Um, and, you know, he's, he's written down what his next steps are. So it's just a really simple way of doing a development log um, and, you know, reducing the amount of time you need to spend on it, but maximizing um, what you get out of it, coming back to it later, and also what your mentor, supervisor, and examiner get out of it as well. So, again, with your arrows, your little arrows, how reflective are your development logs? Now, personally, I am not writing any development logs, so I'm going to put myself up there. Um, so mine are not at all reflective. Um, in fact, we, I'm being chased to write up my appraisal, which I should have done in April. So um, I, uh, I do need to um, get better at this kind of thing. Um, Rob, very honest of you there. Rob Grubb and Nicola, yeah, OK, room for improvement. Chris is Mr. Shiny. There he is. You can see your face in them. Um, they're that reflective. Um, so Chris, despite being the late uh, submitter, is doing things so well that it doesn't really matter that he's leaving it to the last minute. He's, he is Mr. Shiny, so that's more awesome. We should, uh, we're should we all sending our congratulations across the internet to Chris. Um, anyway, so just bear in mind, you know, think about this, because if your development logs aren't reflective at all up here at the top, you're basically wasting your time um, because you're probably writing either so little that it's not really worth writing it at all, in which case that's a waste of everyone's time, or writing so much because you're putting down all sorts of details about things um, that it's wasting your own time. And that's time that you could be spending, you know, on the computer, watching telly, eating with family, with partner, you know, all that sorts of things. People that are doing a bit of reflection, well, that's brilliant. That's much better than up here. Um, and, you know, just keep trying, keep looking at it. Go back and look at that example I gave earlier. And um, this presentation will be um, up on YouTube, so you'll be able to go back and have a look at it later. People like Chris, well, you are at the pinnacle of uh, the pathway uh, pyramid. And um, so, yeah, you don't really need to, uh, to do that. And I will certainly be going in and uh, having a look at what you've been doing um, so that I can check and use them as examples next time. Testing your knowledge. Here we are on, I think, our, our final section. Um, yeah, we're, so we're going to be talking a little bit about um, exams um, and also just about generally about mentor reviews. And this is a section that I go into in more detail with the mentor refresher on, on Thursday. Um, so in the exam itself, and it's never too early to start thinking about the exam. I always say this to people because that, that is the ultimate aim or the pathways to pass this exam. In the exam, there are going to be two examiners and perhaps a monitor who is effectively another examiner. But for the purpose of your exam, he's examining the examiners to see how they're doing things. Um, the exam takes place in an unfamiliar room with unfamiliar people. Um, people are often quite surprised at how stressed or nervous they are. And we see every possible form of nerves 
in the exam waiting room. I've seen people look like they just want to punch me in the nose. Um, I've seen people crying. We had one person almost pass out. Um, you know, you just people shaking, visibly shaking, as if um, they're kind of vibrating. Um, it's very difficult to replicate this kind of scenario, which is probably just as well. And, you know, you'd be surprised how much the stress will build near the time, even though the examiners do want you to pass and aren't trying to catch you out. It is hard to replicate this, and writing notes of what you know and answers to questions, writing out answers to sample questions, is all, you know, very useful. And it's the kind of thing that we all used to do at school, practicing for written exams. But never forget that the pathway exam is not a written exam. Um, it is all about the talking. Um, you need to be able to express yourself, not in written form, but orally. So it's essential that you keep practicing um, answering questions orally. So I would say it was absolutely essential that you have practice at this. And as I've been saying, it's very different recalling what you know on paper um, to when someone has just asked you an unexpected question and you don't have a minute or two to think about it and you know you don't have a chance um, to kind of draw out a little diagram to think about. So um, it's essential, I think, to join some sort of study group as soon as you can, just so that you get used to talking about these things with other people. And if you go on to Talking Landscape, that's a great place to make contact with others, um, see other study groups that are already there, or just you know um, put a, an email up just to try and make contact with others in your local area or others online. And there's also a list of study groups on the Parco website. Um, that you'll be able to get in touch with. Always remember these stage definitions. Let's just see if they highlight again. No, let's go back again. So these are the stage definitions for passing the exam. Remember I said you need to have a majority of stage twos, but you must now be able to show that you have stage three in a number of areas. And those are the ones that are most closely relating to your work. Now, how will the examiners know which ones they are? Well, your mentor will have marked you as stage three in the areas where you are stage three, which are the ones that are assumed to be most closely related to your work. So where in the past, in the old syllabus, we used to have candidates come into the exams who had all threes, for example, and many of those would actually fail um, and not be able to show um, a three level of knowledge in any area, often have difficulty showing one level of knowledge, often due to nerves, but sometimes not. Um, where your mentor has marked you as a three now, you will be expected to demonstrate that you have that thorough knowledge um, and have applied your knowledge. Not, not that you can apply it, but that you have actually applied it in practice. Um, you understand the implications of your actions, you take responsibility, um, and you're working um, with little supervision or the need to seek advice. All right? So you do really need to be able to demonstrate that you can do this, not just in the development logs, but also orally during the exam. So absolutely essential to have this um, practice. Now, it's not just simple oral recall. It is the application of what you would call to professional contexts, which um, is a little bit in stage two, but particularly in stage three as well. And just remember that for stage three, you will be under pressure, not because the examiners are horrible or, or intimidating or anything, but it's just the nature of the exam is that you'll feel under pressure. So you need to be taught able to talk in that context of how you have applied your knowledge in several professional contexts and the implications and liabilities of what we did and then you know theorize about if if this had happened how would this have been different you know or what could you have done differently to create this outcome for example all right so it's it's always oral um, presentation of knowledge that really happens um, sorry really matters um, not writing um, even though we ask you to do the development logs because it's just the best way to communicate your knowledge um, to your mentors and supervisors and the examiners ahead of the exam. Now, I have absolutely roared through this presentation because it is a refresher. So I haven't gone into anything in any near massive detail. Some of it will have been covered in the Introduction to Pathway webinar, which is already online. Some of it will be covered in reflecting um, on your development or in um, planning for the exam, um, which is both taking place later on this month. 
Now, using your arrows for the last time, I really want to see those arrows, um, what I'd like you to do is indicate which of these actions you're going to do before 9 a.m. tomorrow morning, preferably before you go home tonight. Um, you've got a choice. Okay, so what, what we've actually covered is, is why the pathway is that it is in the life cycle. Then we very quickly moved on to deadlines. So one of your actions, and some of you may have already done this, is to add these to your diary now. Okay, so really before you go home tonight. Um, then we discuss the stages. So the next action which Chris is going to do um, is discuss, and, and Isla, is that, I think, um, is discuss the stage definitions of your mentor. You know, if you are going forward to the exam and you need to be able to show that you have that stage three level of knowledge where your mentor has graded you stage three, you need to make sure that your mentor really understands the difference between a stage two and a stage three. We moved on to reflecting on your development. So the action here is to make an appointment with yourself. It's quite difficult to keep this actually. Um, each week or maybe each month, that's more realistic, to update your records, add a few development logs, and just spend a few minutes per development log thinking about what you gained from that experience. Not just what you did, but what you gained from it overall. Um, lastly, we talked about testing your knowledge. And of course, here we've got oral practice with joining a study group. And then also, we didn't really get onto that because it's, it's more in the preparing for the exam webinar. But another one is mock exams. Mock exams are vital. There's a direct correlation between doing mock exams and passing the exam. OK, I'm not saying that no one has ever passed who didn't do a mock exam, but I'm certainly not aware of anyone doing that. All right, so certainly joining a study group, though, as Robert and Rachel are going to be doing, um, is a great first step. And do look on Talking Landscape and look at the list on um, the Pathway websites. If you go onto landscapeinstitute.org, click on Education and click on Pathway, you'll see all the resources there. So click on there for the list of uh, study groups. Now, as I said, I've, I've roared through all this. Um, if anybody has any questions, please do submit them in the chat window. Um, I'm not going to open up the microphones because we've had um, uh, we've had problems with this in the past. With people's microphones not really working that well. I've had a few um, few uh, questions submitted. This is me pausing because I'm trying to read and uh, talk at the same time. Um, Luciana has said um, you said we can submit earlier if possible, but can we submit several projects in the same quarter submission? Yes, you can. You can add as many projects as you're actually working on. So yes, that's absolutely fine. You just keep clicking on Add Project until you've got them all in there. Um, Brian has said, what messages? And I'm not sure which slide that applied to. Um, so I'll have to come back to that one, Brian. If you want to send me a bit more detail in the chat window, then um, that's, that's absolutely fine. Um, Luciana has then said, it's not possible for other delegates to, assess in, to assist in the exam of someone else. Um, it's certainly possible for them to mock examine each other. Um, that would be absolutely fine. Um, and um, that's not a problem at all. Um, and certainly at study groups, um, uh, asking other candidates for help in study groups and questioning each other. I know, I think the, um, is it the London Royal Festival Hall study group seem to have a topic that they cover each week. And they ask each other questions and bring in um, bits of research and so on. That's just from what I've seen on uh, on Talking Landscape. Um, so yes, it's absolutely possible to assist in someone preparing um, in the exam of someone else. Yes, definitely. Um, Chris says, um, can I discuss the difference between the old and the new syllabus? OK, the first thing to say is there is no direct mapping between the old syllabus and the new syllabus. Um, it's not an update of the old syllabus. It's a completely new syllabus, which came from the Elements and Areas of Practice document. I think the best thing I can say on that, because I know I've been going for almost an hour already, is to read or, or rather watch the presentation called Introduction to Pathway 2.0, which is on um, YouTube at the moment. It's a recording of the webinars that took place in August. And, you know, it's brilliant, I say so myself. Um, but it does discuss differences between the old and the new syllabus in more detail. Um, but as I say, there's no direct mapping, which is why the mentor scores in the Q3 mentor review, the one that all of you will be doing next, um, have all reset to zero 
And if that's come as a surprise to you, it has been mentioned in the newsletters, but again, go onto YouTube. Um, the, all the Landscape Institute's videos are under the user Landscape Institute UK, or one word. So if you type that into YouTube, you'll get a list of all our videos. Um, Robert has said, if you fail the exam, do you receive feedback on why and where you can improve? Absolutely you do. It's only people who fail the exam that receive feedback. Um, there are two areas to the feedback. One is a kind of generic, um, you, were, you were okay on this kind of thing, but you weren't so good on this. You know, we feel that perhaps you need more time to consolidate your knowledge of this kind of stuff. We'd advise you to discuss this with your mentor, you know, a bit more kind of generic stuff. The second area of feedback is specific syllabus codes where you gave either an incorrect answer to a question or you were unable to answer the question. So yes, you do get feedback um, so that you can improve if you fail the exam. Um, Rob says, where would we include past experience from before we enrolled on the pathway? Um, this is what the initial review was for. So you would have captured all of your past relevant experience. Remember, it's only relevant experience that the examiners, the supervisors, the mentors are interested in. You may well have spent several years um, working as a, a gardener, say, or I don't know, I don't know, chimney sweep. Um, but if that's not relevant to the syllabus, there's no reason to include it on the pathway. But hopefully you'll have um, put all of that past experience into the initial review um, and captured your level of knowledge when you started the pathway. If not, then um, it's never too late. Simply update your CV. If you log into the pathway and go into the My Details section, you'll see that your CV is there as a PDF. You can update that at any time. We do encourage you to update it every time you submit. We tell you when the last time was that you updated it. So do go on there and have a look at that. Okay, that is all the questions that I've had in the chat window. Great questions, by the way, very happy with those. Don't normally get as many as that, so that's wonderful. Although possibly it just means that I didn't cover enough stuff in this presentation. I could probably have gone on for another couple of hours, but I think one hour is enough. I'm going to stop there. So, um, oh, sorry, Chris has just said that he'll be adding questions to Talking Landscape for next week, week's uh, Royal Festival Hall study group. Excellent. There we are. So now I know which Chris it is as well. We're all doomed. Um, all right, thank you very much for attending everybody. The recording of this session will go up on YouTube um, within the next few days, so I'll send an email around to all the candidates when that's there. All right, thank you. Goodbye.